we have Jack in Arizona who is a theist and wants to talk to us about the problem of evil. Welcome, Jack. You're on with Brandon and Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi, Brandon. How are you? Howdy. I'm all right. Doing yeah, all right. What do you got? I wanted to uh, hear your take on if you think the problem of evil is a compelling reason in and of itself to believe or disbelieve in a god or at least in a good god. Yeah, Matt, you tell me how much you want me to talk and how much you want to answer. Uh, you know, there's a, a famous YouTuber, uh, since I'm aspiring to be a YouTuber, Alex O'Connor, who prefers to call it the problem of suffering. And I think there's good reason for that. But to answer your question, I think that the problem of evil should be a consideration to not believe in a God if that God claims to not be evil, if that, cl if that God mm -hmm. claims to be all benevolent. So, I mean, that's the, the short answer. I think if you want to believe in an evil God, fine. Um, but if you have a holy book that is dedicated to professing that this God is anything but evil, even though at the same time it professes he's the creator of evil, I think we have an issue that needs to, to start being addressed. Uh, my question would be, what would the world have to look like in order for you to uh, maybe feel like it's possible that God could be good? Like what would have to change? Yeah, I, uh, again, Matt, you're going to cut me off. Uh, no, you'll you have to cut me off. Okay. Um, I wouldn't be the kind of person that says there can't be any suffering. Fine. And and there's good philosophical arguing about uh, a certain amount of necessary suffering in a world that actually has free will. I have problems to think that God has given us free will, but if you, even if we want to play by the rules of the Bible and believe that we have free will, I think that we have a clear abundance of unnecessary, avoidable suffering that we do not need in a world that has to have it for free will to work out. I don't know if I'm making sense to you. And so if you want to, if you want to go further with that, let me know. Yeah. But so like, for example, um, what things do you think are incompatible? Like, for example, one thing that's often brought up, and I think it was Stephen Fry that mentioned this when he was asked, what he would say to God. I think he said something along the lines of, you know, what's the deal with cancer in children, right? And he went on and listed a number of things he felt were incompatible with a world that has a benevolent God. I guess my follow-up question to that would be, like, how far do you have to go? Like, obviously, cancer in children is terrible, but we should also remove all disease, right? And then kids also die in car accidents, so we should probably get rid of cars and they die in house fires, so we should get rid of fires. Like, it seems like you could take that argument basically anywhere, and any existence of suffering whatsoever would appear to be proof that God is not good. I understand. Yeah. I understand. I'm going to jump in for a second here, because I'm somebody who doesn't tend to use the problem of evil uh, or the problem of suffering uh, as a primary argument against a God concept. I realize that it's it's incredibly powerful for a lot of people, but some people are are have given up religion entirely because of this. It's just the the um, the, the excessive suffering, the the senseless suffering in the world doesn't make sense to them. Uh, for me, saying hey, what would need to change about the world so that it wouldn't be a, a problematic God? If you have as a notion that we're all going to live, or that some portion of humanity is going to live forever in a heaven where there is no suffering. Um, and that God already knows who's going to go there, then why not just make everybody who's going to be there there already and skip past all the rest of this? If God's the type that knows everything that's going to happen and has a plan, um, then he knows I'm going to spend eternity in hell or annihilated. And, you know, my mom's going to spend eternity in heaven. Why put any of us through any of that? Why not just create those individuals there? Um, it, to, I to say that really it question. needs... To, to say that it needs to happen means that God is at least deficient in, in what he can do. But I don't, I don't think that any atheist I've talked to is opposed to the notion of suffering. And I appreciate the fact that you're asking, like, where do you draw the line? Um, God could have created a world where human beings reproduce asexually. There are other creatures on the planet that reproduce asexually. And we could have been one of those species. And if that's the case, then you no longer have any rape, which means that you can't have sexual assaults against kids. And that 
resolves a massive problem. It doesn't violate anybody's free will. People still have free will. It's just that this isn't a part of who we are. And that doesn't even fit into the category of normal, like excessive suffering that people like to go to. Because when you go to something like cancer, if Adam and Eve's sin uh, brought sin and death into the world, is that what brought cancer into? Is that part of it? And does it need to be cancer? And I, th I think one of my favorite examples um, from Sir David Attenborough is there's a worm that lays its eggs inside of you and the worm eats through your eyeball. At a minimum, that doesn't need to exist. That level of bizarre um, interaction between two species has nothing to do with free will, has nothing to do with our desires. It just, here's something that nature produced that is absolutely terrifying. Like, like if you don't shudder when you hear about a worm that is eating its way out through your eyeballs, and every, I don't know, like, that to me is the pinnacle of inhuman to not just absolutely shudder when that happens. Things like that. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think and there's a, pretty metal. Yeah, and th th there's a, a huge list of them. And I think that the most reasonable explanation when you look at all this is that there's so much in nature that does not give a crap about us and that only makes sense in the light of an unguided process where it's survival. I, I hate survival of the fittest because that's not a really accurate description of evolution but w where this sort of i'm going to live in order for me to live something else has to die that's that's everything i don't care if you're vegan or not in order for you to live something has to die and there's a lot of it that seems to be in order for me to live something else has to die in a very particular cruel way i think that's my kind of take on problem of evil well, it's interesting you mention like a parasitic worm. Uh, I think the scariest form of evil comes from humans. And I think the idea that God could take away evil without taking away human free will, I, it just doesn't make sense to me because obviously I'd like to live in a world without genocide and war and torture and murder and abuse of every kind. But it seems like if we were to do that, we would have to also take away the capability to choose. And I think like any story, whether you're talking about a human story or say the art that we create that mimics life, seems like the vast majority of suffering comes from human choice. I, uh, is there free will? I'd like to say, is there free will in heaven? I actually don't believe in, I'm not a Christian. I, the sure. reason why I'm no longer a Christian is because of your show. Um, I say the closest thing that I ascribe to, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Alan Watts. Yeah. I find him really compelling. I think he makes a very good argument. A lot of atheists joke that um, God is the hide and seek champion. And honestly, I don't think it's that far off. Uh, I think this also kind of alludes a little bit to, and I don't want to get off topic because you were making some good points, but, I think this alludes a little bit to the problem of divine hiddenness. I think if God was plainly visible all the time, I think it would spoil a lot of the mystery. Like a lot of movies, when I go in, I don't want to know the ending. Like if I walked into the movie The Sixth Sense and someone spoiled the ending that Bruce Willis was dead the whole time. I'd be Careful. Off, oh, so. man, why'd you do that? Shit, sorry. I didn't mean to do that to anyone who hasn't seen that movie. But I think the reality is, the main, part of the amazing aspect of life is that you get to discover, you know, the purpose for yourself. And I feel like if God showed up when we were six or seven and said, hey, I'm God, here's the purpose of life, you know, here's all the mysteries of the universe, I feel like that would take away most of the fun, don't you? I mean, no. like... Jack, first of all, you're talking about my three favorite things, and so I'm, I'm racing them thousand miles a minute here, free will, divine hiddenness, and the problem of suffering or evil. But you keep doing the same thing that I'd like to maybe point out, which is this little black or white okay. fallacy of 
if they're, you know, go, going back to the first part, hey, okay, where's the line? You know, some kids are still going to die in car accidents. So therefore there shouldn't be mm -hmm. a line at all. Or the line shouldn't be back here. Like the fact is there is a line and you can have less divine hiddenness without God sitting on your shoulders 24 seven ruining the mystery, right? There's, there's this whole gray area in between that even getting back to the free will thing, God created the initial framework, right? He, mm -hmm. you know, to, to Matt's point about, hey, he could have made us asexual. He made us people that were capable of genocide, of, of forming large groups yeah. like this. Like he set these boundaries in place and then supposedly let free will just take off. But it's so much had to be chosen from an all-powerful, all-knowledgeable foreknowledge being that doesn't make sense even with free yeah. will. You know what I mean? I think it's. It's impossible for me to be able, and I think you're completely right. I'm probably committing 15 fallacies because I'm not. I'm not trying to call you out on a specific been... fallacy. I'm just saying, like, there's a there's a real obvious lacking of like, could there have been something less? Could God still? I think a there could have certainly been something less suffering or less painful. Um, but I think in order for human beings to be able to consciously choose good, I feel like the option for evil has to be there. If, even like, let's say even for if example, we agreed on that, though, think about it. Think about what you just said. It could be less painful. It could be less suffering. Then that's yeah. the whole, that's, you wrapped up the entire problem of suffering. It's not that suffering shouldn't exist. It's that there's an unnecessary amount. And the soon, as soon as you can say there could be less, God could have made our pain receptors, dial those receptors down 50%, mm -hmm. right? Like, and we'd still have all the same appreciation. We'd still love the sunshiny sure. day. From the cold day but we wouldn't have to freeze to death at x temperature it could go way lower a point that the earth can never get to like there's a billion trillion possibilities that god could have done things different to achieve less suffering less pain and that's not what we have i think you're completely right he could have dialed back the pain sensors 50 percent, but i think that would have also dialed back our capacity to appreciate like i think a lot of our capacity to uh, grow and develop as human beings comes from our own suffering. Like I know in my personal life and the life of a lot of people I know, like when I got cancer and overcame that, that really made me value life a lot more. And it made me appreciate the good parts of life so much more. I mean, God could have not, and I'm not saying God gave me cancer, but more than anything, it's just the society we live in and all the pollution and, you know, bad foods we eat. I think the vast majority of cancer is probably human created, but in any would case, you wish cancer I think on your... re... can I ask you this for, and I'm, I'm being sincere. This isn't a gotcha question. Knowing that you had cancer and you've been able to appreciate something in life better because of the trial you went through, which I applaud you. You made lemonade out of lemons and that's wonderful. Sure. But would you wish for your kids then to also have cancer so they could come to the same realization? Or would you hope that there are other lesser things in life that can still challenge them that would allow them to still reach your uh, appreciation? That's a great question. And honestly, I wouldn't wish cancer on anyone, not even a worst enemy. I mean, it's terrible. Well, I got if it God loves us and we're his children, years. why would he wish it on us? And by allowing for its very existence, like I understand you're using a personal example, but I think it's just that clear. Yeah. Like you're saying, hey, I wouldn't wish this on anyone. And you're not an all benevolent being. You probably even have enemies and people you don't like, and you still wouldn't wish it on them because you know that no matter yeah. how much pleasure you've received from beating it and being appreciative of life, it didn't compensate you fully. See, this is the whole problem that I think we have in general is that there's this compensation that we'll get from the pain, from the suffering, even if the fi I final compensation is heaven. I don't think it, you can ever say that, it, that it's enough because it's, it's unnecessary. I think a question I would ask to you is, like, are you okay with, I, are you okay with your kids say, let's say, I don't know if you have kids or not, but you know, let's say you have kids have and two beautiful they're in a kids. relationship with that. So let's say, yeah, your kids grow up and they're in a relationship and they get broken up with and they have heartbreak. I mean, should we wish that they never go through that or does that grow them as a person? I mean, I think there's a lot of things in life that if we never faced any challenges, let's say we lived a life where everything was handed to us, 
Why? You never faced any disease. Hang on, Jack. Why do you keep going back yeah. to this straw man? Neither myself, nor Brandon, nor Alex, nor any of the other people who are talking about a, 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 a the problem of excessive suffering is suggesting that anyone could or should go through life without anything remotely negative happening to them. And yet every time we turn it, or well, not every time, but when we, when we turn it back over to you to talk, you keep mm -hmm. going to this, oh, this could build people's character and everything else. Yes, I agree. And you know what else? If I put my hand on a hot stove, it burns me and it teaches me what not to do. And there's a lesson to be learned and I can learn something good out of it. But could I have learned that lesson another way? And could it have been the case that instead of ever having the opportunity to burn myself and feel pain, I would burn myself and get damaged without the pain. Um, and that would be enough to potentially learn the lesson. This is a good chunk of this is a failed imagination on the part of human beings of what a God could do. And what you're actually kind of loosely arguing for is that it would be a reasonable response to the problem of evil or problem of suffering to say that God has created the best of all possible worlds for the goal that he has that, and you know, the, there's some goal to life that God has, and this is the best that it could be. And that's fine. But this is now part of why I'm not a fan of arguing about the problem of evil, because I don't think it strongly disproves any God. And I think that it's trivially easy for a God believer to say, oh yeah, you know, you need some problems here so that you grow and learn. And, um, you know, there's free will and people interact. And so this is just the best that God could do for now, um, which doesn't get to why we, you know, couldn't all be, or who, he couldn't make whoever he wanted in heaven to begin with. But let's stop going to the, the hyperbole of uh, suggesting that either of us are suggesting that we should live a life without suffering. We didn't do that. We wouldn't do mm -hmm. that. I don't want to make you think that because I think that would be dishonest for me to say. And I apologize if I at any point made you think that I, I believe that about you guys. I, I think that, honestly, like in my view of it, I think that there's absolutely things that are unnecessary that don't help us grow as individuals. But, yeah, I mean, you're right. There's things like there's types of suffering that I would love to see not exist. But as someone who has a very limited perspective, I think it's impossible for me to be able to see it from the bigger picture, you know, to not view it from my own lens. I mean, all I could do is contribute my own perspective. Yeah, I understand. I just think it's important to to zoom out on that perspective, right? You know, the the your the whole of the argument in general comes back to some kind of compensation, whether it is heaven or something we learn and glean in this life now. You know, the why not heaven now issue that Matt raised is uh is the answer for the the four year old who's born in a third world country in a third world country and has a miserable life for four years until they starve to death. They never hear about God. Mm -hmm. And yeah, let's assume general revelation. So they somehow get to go to heaven, even though it's not what the Bible says. That's the compensation. I made you to torture you, to have you die without knowing me. By my grace, you're still here in heaven now. Is this compensated? I, I th and many Christians believe that. Yes, that child is compensated. He was born of a fallen world with free will and God is making it right. I disagree. And and there's a thousand thought experiment analogies that I won't bring up now, but I'd encourage you to maybe look some up on the issue of why not heaven now apologetics, because I think it's a very hard thing to really argue that the immense human I mean, suffering that, we don't even get yeah. a benefit in this world is compensated in the next life. And that's why I don't agree in Christianity with Christianity. Sure. I'm um, sorry. You did say you're a theist. Yeah, I'm, I'm a theist, but I would say, especially like I, I actually um, started watching Atheist Experience back in like 2000, I want to say seven or eight after I left a really fundamentalist church. And it helped me a lot. So, I mean, I, I do appreciate being able to deconvert that way, I think. But a big part, and I'm, I'll acknowledge a big part of the reason why I still believe is I, I can't get past the fact that um, there's absolutely an element of wishfulness or a, a desire for there to be a bigger purpose. So I can absolutely acknowledge that I'm biased in that way. But yeah. when I get down to trying to objectively line up the evidence, 
you know, the, the arguments from atheists against the argument or against the existence of a good God or of a God in general, um, I don't necessarily find them convincing. And I guess on some level, just the vast complexity of the universe, and I know complexity is not proof of God, but just for me, it just, it strikes me as weird that we're this amalgamation of atoms that are communicating through this device that would be magic 100, 200 years ago. And I don't necessarily attribute that to God, but I think it's fascinating that there's so many things we don't understand. And I guess I would be really disappointed if I learned that it's just oblivion and there's no inherent meaning to life. I would like to believe that, but I acknowledge that I'm biased. I think I'd be more disappointed to find out that there was some afterlife that we had no good reason to think existed or to be able to verify or to be able to understand the the criteria or the soteriology that might potentially lead to that. It's like yeah. when people look at I, I had a I had a cousin that um lived for a few years but never really left a bassinet. Um, and you take that child and the one that Brandon was talking about earlier that lives for four years and absolutely suffers in, in poverty and misery and malnutrition, mm -hmm. um, and some other, take a baby that survives three seconds after delivery before stroking out in a, in a grand suffering fashion and just dies immediately. What I hear from some believers who are trying to make sense of those three scenarios is mm -hmm. something that I know provides comfort for them because it used to provide comfort for me. And now it absolutely fucking pisses me off because what they'll say is, ah, God afflicted that person for our benefit. There was some lesson that we needed to learn and we needed to learn it so bad that God allowed this absolute waste of a life of someone who never, you know, never really felt joy. You talk about a kid getting heartbroken after their first love. Um, yeah, that's bad, but there was joy before that. And the, there are all these people who say, oh, the life is so hard. The antinatalists who are like, oh, you brought a child into the world without their consent when life is just way more miserable than it is pleasurable. Well, I don't find life more miserable than pleasurable, despite having quite a lot of miserable things about it. But what I find most frustrating isn't that there's misery or pain or suffering, but when it's completely uncoupled from joy. And my life's had a mountains of joy at different times. I, I, I was joyous multiple times today um, while having a toothache and a stomachache. It, the, the notion that God needs to inflict and, and make a child suffer so that somebody else can come to some realization is barbaric and, and wholly unimaginative. What kind of God can't teach a, a, a properly functioning human mind, a valuable lesson without torturing another one. What kind of God make on a bet allows the torment of Job? What was the purpose of that? I always actually found that story to be really weird. Actually. And I agree. That was one of the more bizarre stories. And, and that was yeah. uh, something I, I like to uh, really I asked a ton of questions, and actually the church I went to, I didn't realize it until later, but they did a sermon where they said, if you don't agree with the church, just leave. And he started talking about a guy. He referenced the conversation he had. I didn't realize and put the pieces together. Oh, wait a second. He's talking about me because I was questioning the genocide account. And all the things you're saying are things that I question myself. Like my grandparents died of cancer, and they went through a lot of misery, and Many times in my life and my parents' life, they question, well, why does this even exist? And I agree. I wish I had the answer to that, but I'm just a human. And I don't necessarily agree with the perspective that it's something that, like, God gleefully, 
you know, does to humans just to kind of like prove his point or I don't necessarily, I think to me, I would like to live in a world without child death and suffering, but what would that look like? I don't really know how to compare the way the world is now to like the way the ideal world should look like. Like yeah, I, I that's think how you're, being... that's how you started the conversation. And I, and I think it's totally fair to have a failure of imagination on what a Supreme being could or would do. But if we can very quickly imagine a world even slightly better then it stands to reason that there is a world that could be slightly better or much better once given a divine mind and a supreme all powerfulness. Right. And so I understand and appreciate that you left Christianity because of the issues and you're just at theism in general. And you like the idea of a God, you like the idea of mystery and there's so much beauty and awe about the world. And I can appreciate that there very well might be a creator. I am totally agnostic to this concept. I think that the Yahweh character mm -hmm. is falsifiable. Um, and I even think yeah. I would go as far as to say the problem of evil, according to the, the decrees that God makes about himself falsifies God, at least his character or his ability to be true. But when it comes to just wanting a God in general, what I would encourage you, because I don't know how much more time we'll get with you is, man, it's once you have that God proposition, it's hard to let it go. I, I get that. And they're like, okay, yeah. the one I thought it was, it's not that one anymore, but surely there's a God. Then it's on him or it or her or whatever, right? Like back to divine hiddenness. You know, if we have a God that did create this world, this was the best he could do. Maybe he's not all powerful and maybe he moved on and he's out somewhere else creating another world. Why, why give him any more mind until he shows up and gives us reason to, you know, Matt talks all the time about the unreasonableness of believing in, in a God in general. And I, I think that take it a step further, not only is it unreasonable, but there, what, what can we do with it if we can't get any details? So if you don't believe in one of these man-made gods, you just believe in a creator great but then like move on from the rest of the issues that are associated with man-made gods i think alan yeah. watts made a good point i think i could end it on this i would love to hear your perspective on this but and i'm going to butcher this because he, he speaks very eloquently and i don't but he basically said something along the lines of you know we look at the human immune system and we see all this chaos and destruction and this cell eating that cell and all of this madness and then we zoom out, and that's part of a healthy functioning immune system. And something that, and he doesn't say this, but I noticed it's like something we know is good, like a vaccine. The immune system, to the immune system, a vaccine seems like a terrible thing because it's introducing a foreign pathogen, and it seems like it's introducing an invader. So from the perspective of the immune system, it doesn't have the whole picture. It might think, oh, this needle coming into my arm, that's a terrible thing. But a vaccine is actually one of the best health advancements in human history. So I think it's easy for us as human beings with very limited perspective to say the world as it stands now is not the best possible world or this could be better or that could be better. And I agree, you know, children starving and, and genocide, war, all these things are awful. But for us to be able to say, well, God could have done this and God could have done that, and we, we can make that argument endlessly, I don't know the full purpose of suffering, and I don't pretend to, but I know personally in my own life suffering and the lives of people around me, as a human, you could choose to turn that suffering into something meaningful and mm -hmm. as a source of empathy and compassion for your fellow human and as a way to kind of bring together people, or you could use it as a source of hate and division. It's up to you. That's really how I, I look at it. One thing, one thing, Matt, and then yeah. I'll, I'll shut up and I'll leave it to you. You went all the way back, man. You went all the way in a circle and you went back to that there's this all or nothing approach to it. Where, right now, there's a little girl that just got trafficked and she's being raped for the first time. And there's she's not some cell that's part of a great organism that's going to compensate for some vaccine, some good to get some better. There's nothing better coming for her. There's nothing better for me. There's nothing better for the human race for the fact that she was raped other than some man's sick pleasure. That's it. That's the only benefit. Like, I understand you want to say like zoom out and there's this organism, but we're people. And but we're conscious. But on the God or on the man who did that? I feel like that's a human It would be on the person problem, who created the world where this is a concept that can happen, who could have done better. And that's what we're arguing, that hey, it doesn't have to awful. not exist at all, but there, it could be better. It's, so, really, it's really that simple, I think. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this call mostly because we've got other people to get on to. And the other reason is, like I said at the beginning of this call, I genuinely don't give a shit about the problem of suffering. I don't find it. I find the conversations go like this all the time. And you mentioned, Jack, that we have okay. this limited human perspective, but I have no other perspective to use. Uh, limited human perspective is still the best perspective that we have, and it's the one that we're constantly trying to improve. So if the case is this is the best world that a God could come up with and still allow something like our will, free or otherwise, um, to bear out. Okay, cool. You've now explained away an apparent contradiction or apparent incompatibility between the way the world is and the way some version of some God might potentially want it to be. And yet, explaining the way con that contradiction, you still have all of the work in front of you, not you necessarily, but all the work in front of you to prove that there's any God at all let alone the one we just rationalized a compatibility with. And that's why I don't find this that great. It, it's it's a, the problem of evil, the problem of suffering, needs someone who's advocating for a specific God that is fundamentally incompatible with something we observe. In that way, it gets, it gets put in a reductio ad absurdum to say that there may be some God, but the one you're advocating for is incompatible with a fact of reality. And that's its only usefulness. Um, on, on that mm -hmm. note, call us back another time. Jack, I got, I got other calls I got to yeah, get to today, sure. but thank thanks for, for the tone. Thanks, call. Jack. Hello, I'm Jimmy Snow, executive producer for The Line and avid candy eater. Hey, if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so now on Patreon or as a channel member with tiers specific to supporting specific shows and hosts. And it also supports our ability to expand programming going forward. You could also leave a super thanks down below, get a little special highlighted comment, and I'll tell you what, you could hit like and you could hit subscribe. Now, here are some video suggestions so we can fudge that algorithm. Go with one of ours. Forget everyone else on YouTube. I'm begging.